Hi, and welcome to episode 50 of Talk Signals TV, where we bring you the biggest in cannabis and hemp news stories every week. I'm Steve Elliott. I'm the host at TalkSignals.com, and I'll be guiding you through the news. First of all, let's take a look at our Talk Signals Bud Pick of the Week. An update on the progress of our Frankenstein. She's an indica. She's now 26 days into flower. She is basking under some high-pressure sodium lighting with LED side lighting, and as you can see, she's enjoying it. Let's do the news now, shall we? Big news from the District of Columbia this week, where marijuana decriminalization takes effect in our nation's capital. A marijuana decrim law passed by the D.C. Council took effect at 12.01 a.m. on Thursday in Washington, D.C. The new law, like others around the United States, eases penalties for minor cannabis possession. Unless someone is found to possess more than an ounce of marijuana in D.C., they will now simply be written a $25 ticket and the officer will confiscate the pot. Police can no longer detain someone simply because they smell marijuana and they can no longer demand identification from anyone carrying under an ounce. Civil violation notices that police already handed out for littering have been changed now to also include possession of marijuana and they now list the $25 fine for pot right there on the ticket. Possession of less than an ounce of cannabis will cost less than the fine for throwing a roach on the ground. That'll get you fined $75 for littering. As of midnight, Wednesday night, no member can make or approve an arrest for marijuana possession without having first taken this training, Metropolitan Police Department spokeswoman Gwendolyn Crump told the Washington Times. Selling marijuana will still get you arrested in D.C., but giving someone an ounce or less of weed without receiving payment is now just a civil violation and not an arrestable offense in the District of Columbia. Possession of drug paraphernalia directly associated with one ounce or less of marijuana is also not an arrestable offense. There will still be civil penalties for those caught smoking marijuana in public or caught with it on federal government property. The new law was prompted by reports of stark racial disparities in marijuana arrests. Predictably, cops are unhappy with the changes. Delroy Burton, chairman of the D.C. Police Union, criticized the new law as too vague and confusing to officers on the street. That's a rather disingenuous argument, given the fact that under the old system, marijuana possession meant handcuffs, fingerprinting, and forensic analysis, and now it means checking a box on a ticket for marijuana possession instead of littering. I have faith that highly trained police officers can handle that, don't you? This is not a simple issue, Burton claimed, evidently cowed by the idea of having to tick off a checkbox on a ticket. It's about enforcement and decriminalization and where you draw the line of what officers can do and cannot do, he said. Our officers are going to have to go out there and enforce a convoluted mess, he whined. Well, no, Officer Burton, your officers are going to have to go out there and check off boxes on tickets, then go about their lives instead of throwing people in jail for possession of a plant. I suggest you find a way to come to terms with that, sir. The U.S. Park Police, Secret Service, and Capitol Police can still arrest anyone carrying any amount of marijuana under federal drug laws. Those offenses would be presented to the U.S. Attorney's Office in D.C. for prosecution. But D.C. police, who have made the vast majority of marijuana arrests in the district, will have to reluctantly abide by the new law. Under the law, the odor of marijuana coming from a vehicle can prompt an investigation of whether that driver is impaired, but not whether the driver or other occupants of the vehicle are in possession of marijuana. Advocates are seeking to have marijuana legalization put on the D.C. ballot in November. According to recent polling, their initiative is likely to be successful should it qualify. More big news in the United States emanating from Capitol Hill, where the House of Representatives has voted to allow banks to work with marijuana stores and dispensaries. In this historic vote, the U.S. House on Wednesday passed a bipartisan amendment by Representatives Denny Heck of Washington, a Democrat, Ed Perlmutter, a Democrat from Colorado, Barbara Lee, a Democrat from California, and Dana Rohrabacher, a Republican from California, preventing the Treasury Department from spending any funding to penalize financial institutions that provide services to marijuana businesses that are legal under state laws. 
That amendment passed 231 to 192. Back in May, the House had passed an amendment prohibiting the Drug Enforcement Administration from undermining state medical marijuana laws and passed two amendments prohibiting the DEA from interfering with state hemp laws. Congress is yet again rejecting the failed war on marijuana, according to Bill Piper, Director of National Affairs for the Drug Policy Alliance. They have read the poll numbers and are doing both what is right and what is politically smart. A recent Pew Research Center survey found that nearly three of every four Americans, 72 percent, believe that efforts to enforce marijuana laws cost more than they are worth. That includes 78 percent of independents, 71 percent of Democrats, and 67 percent of Republicans. There is strong support for state medical marijuana programs with 80 percent of Democrats, 76 percent of independents, and 61 percent of Republicans supporting the sale and use of medical marijuana in their state. 23 states in the District of Columbia have laws that legalize and regulate marijuana for medicinal purposes. 11 states have laws on the books or about to be signed into law by their governors regulating CBD oils, a non-psychotropic component of medical marijuana which some parents are utilizing to treat their children's seizures. A majority of Americans support taxing and regulating marijuana like alcohol. Two states have legalized marijuana roughly like alcohol, Colorado and Washington. Alaska voters will vote on legalizing marijuana in August, and Oregon voters will vote on legalization in November. The underlying spending bill that the Heck Marijuana Amendment was attached to also contains an amendment added in committee by Representative Andy Harris, a Republican from Maryland, that would block Washington, D.C. from carrying out any law, rule, or regulation to legalize or otherwise reduce criminal penalties for marijuana. That amendment was originally directed at blocking implementation of a recent law the District of Columbia passed replacing jail time for possessing small amounts of pot for personal use with a small fine. But that marijuana decrim law, as we learned in the last story, took effect at midnight or at 12.01 a.m. on Thursday, long before the Harris Amendment would take effect. And it's also likely that the Harris Amendment would fail to pass the Senate, where the appropriations process has ground to a halt. President Obama has also threatened to veto the underlying bill. In a statement of administration policy, the White House declared, similarly, the administration strongly opposes the language in the bill preventing the district from using its own local funds to carry out locally passed marijuana policies, which again undermines the principles of states' rights and of district home rule. Furthermore, the language poses legal challenges to the Metropolitan Police Department's enforcement of all marijuana laws currently in force in the district. Advocates warn that if the Harris Amendment does make it into law this year, it could block implementation of Initiative 71 by local officials, should D.C. voters pass it this November. That's the legalization initiative. And it could block efforts by local lawmakers to tax and regulate adult marijuana sales. If passed by D.C. voters, Initiative 71 would allow adults over 21 to possess up to two ounces on their person at any time and allow them to cultivate up to six plants. Moving to Illinois this week where it was announced that medical marijuana could be available to patients in early 2015. Patients there in Illinois who qualify under the state's medical cannabis pilot program could be able to start legally using marijuana early next year, according to program coordinator Bob Morgan. He's a lawyer for the Illinois Department of Public Health. Right now, we think it's a good time for patients to be having that conversation with their physicians and their caregivers if they have any interest in participating in the program. Morgan said. The powerful Joint Committee on Administrative Rules plans to meet in Chicago to discuss the rules to implement the state's medical marijuana program. If the committee agrees on the rules, the process to register patients, dispensaries, and growers can begin. Patients who were approved by the state as having debilitating medical conditions qualifying for medical marijuana will be able to get identification cards beginning this September, according to Morgan, but the application process will be staggered. Applications for those who want to sell or grow marijuana will be out around the same time, he said. State officials will likely have to winnow those applications down. The business permits for locations throughout the state are limited to just 60 for dispensaries and 21 for growers. Medical marijuana used in the Illinois program must be grown in Illinois and will likely be ready for consumption in early 2015, Morgan said. The state still doesn't know exactly how many patients will be participating in the program, we do know that there are at least 100,000 to 200,000 patients that will be eligible just based on medical conditions, Morgan said. About 10,000 people will become registered as medical marijuana patients, estimates the D.C.-based Marijuana Policy Project. 
but that'll likely take some time, according to legislative analyst Chris Lindsay. Morgan said the state expects at least tens of thousands in the first year, and that program might develop a little more quickly in Illinois than in some other states, Lindsay said, because a lot of people now know about medical marijuana, and they've heard about it coming to Illinois. The next story also deals with Illinois, where medical marijuana is now legal, but where are the authorizing physicians? Now that medicinal cannabis has come to the state of Illinois, how can qualified patients get authorized to legally use it? Well, that's a good question because that can be a problem when physicians willing to certify patients for the state's medical cannabis pilot program are problematically scarce, according to a new study. In a week-long study conducted by DePaul University students, 294 physicians' offices were contacted from a list provided on the Illinois Department of Financial and Professional Regulations Physician Profile Search, and they were asked whether or not their practitioners would be certifying patients for the medical use of marijuana in Illinois. The offices ranged from small family practices with just one physician to large hospitals with hundreds of physicians practicing in one field. The offices were located throughout Illinois. Half of the physicians contacted were primary care physicians, while half were specialists in the fields of gastroenterology, ophthalmology, oncology, neurology, pain management, infectious disease, and rheumatology. Despite the broad variety of physicians contacted as part of the study, the results yielded an overwhelming answer of no to the patients seeking medical marijuana recommendations. Of those 294 offices contacted, 157 reported that they would not see medical marijuana patients. 132 of the offices expressed that they were not sure what their physicians would be doing to help patients in the future. Many of those offices had shockingly little information, having no idea that medical marijuana is even legal in Illinois, although the pilot program has been in effect since January the 1st. In total, only five offices of the 294 contacted confirmed that their physicians were willing to sign Illinois medical marijuana recommendations, five out of 294. Pamela Jacoby, who's chief executive of Chicago's first medical marijuana business, Good Intentions and Medical Marijuana Services, expressed her concern for patients in Illinois. The lack of physician involvement in any state's medical marijuana program is and should be a serious concern, she said. Physicians are the gatekeepers for successful state programs, and although there are many people suffering from the debilitating conditions which would, by Illinois law, qualify them for the program, they are at a loss to find physicians willing to help. The Illinois Department of Financial and Professional Regulations suggested that one would be able to call around to offices and find a participating physician easily. But this study proves that this is absolutely not the case. If patients cannot find physicians, they cannot receive adequate treatment. And this is the basis of the potential failure of the Illinois Medical Cannabis Pilot Program. In the United States this week, black police leaders said that marijuana prohibition damages minority communities. The president of the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives, Noble, on Tuesday said that America's marijuana laws are total failures. John Dixon III, police chief in Petersburg, Virginia, speaking at Noble's annual conference in Grand Rapids, Michigan, said law enforcement is too concerned with busting people for minor marijuana offenses. We, as law enforcement professionals, we need to really take a look at how we can decriminalize marijuana, especially user amounts, Dixon said. We are locking people up for a dime bag, for a joint. They're put in the criminal justice system, which pretty much ruins the rest of their lives, Dixon said, adding that medical professionals should be in charge of dealing with drug use. Why do I have to lock you up for that, he said. What benefit am I giving you then? We have to get out of this business. That should be the focus of the medical field. Sometimes we've got to say the things that most of law enforcement isn't going to say, Dixon said. The ACLU has released a study showing that the marijuana laws are disproportionately enforced against minorities across the United States, despite the fact that blacks and whites use cannabis at similar rates. Major Neil Franklin, a veteran of 34 years with the Maryland State Police and Baltimore Police Department, and now Executive Director of Law Enforcement Against Prohibition, LEAP, also attended Tuesday's seminar. Franklin said law enforcement officers are in a good position to see the problems that pot laws pose as they deal with them in the field every day. According to Franklin, the war on drugs has already been lost. Who, who do you want to control drugs in your neighborhood and your community, he asked. The cartels? The 20,000 gangs we have around the country? Or do we want to take control of it, regulate it, control it? 
Franklin urged the lawmen attending the seminar to push for marijuana decriminalization. There's no more powerful voice than the people in the trenches, Franklin said. He pointed out that many police oppose marijuana law reform because they make so much money from prohibition. Police agencies can obtain cash and property through drug forfeiture laws, and private for-profit prisons also benefit greatly from the war on drugs, Franklin said. Marijuana is one of the biggest money makers for law enforcement agencies today, he said. Art Way, an attorney and manager for the Drug Policy Alliance in Denver, said the war on drugs pushed back strides that we made in the 1960s. Money is on the side of mass incarceration, Way said. We're supporting the drug war industry. Mid-level drug dealers are doing more time than murderers, rapists, and robbers. It's not your job to deal with someone's addiction, Way told the crowd of law enforcement officers. Addiction is a health problem. It's not a criminal problem. We need to put the ills of our community where they belong. In Missouri this week, a small sign of progress as the governor signed the CBD-only medical marijuana law. Missouri Governor Jay Nixon on Monday signed legislation into law that allows the use of cannabidiol oil extracted from marijuana to treat epileptic seizures that can't be effectively treated by pharmaceuticals. This legislation was sponsored by State Senator Eric Schmidt, a Republican from St. Louis County whose nine-year-old son has epilepsy. Patients and parents who want to use CBD oil will be required to register with the Missouri Department of Health and also have a neurologist verify that the patient's epilepsy hasn't responded to at least three other pharmaceutical treatments. Why on earth would they only use the most effective and least toxic option when all the others have been exhausted? I don't know. When asked what all the Missouri families who had moved to Colorado for legal access to CBD oil should do, Governor Nixon replied, move back to Missouri. When pressed on the question of whether such families would be prosecuted, Governor Nixon said, it would be better to talk to the Attorney General's office about that. All I know is the measure I signed today will help us move forward to make sure Missouri can provide these therapies to families in need. And in California this week, Los Angeles tried to shut down its marijuana farmers market. Los Angeles City Attorney Mike Fewer said he will seek on Tuesday to shut down medical marijuana farmers market that launched in the Boyle Heights section of Los Angeles two weeks ago. Fewer said he will seek a restraining order blocking the operation of what he called the so-called farmer's market. The city attorney claimed the market violates Proposition D, the voter approved ordinance that restricts the number of medical marijuana dispensaries allowed to operate in Los Angeles. Fewer also claimed that the event constitutes a nuisance to the residents of the neighborhood. It also fails we allege to comply with basic city land use laws, Fewer claimed, and they couldn't get a permit if they tried. So for many reasons, from the violation of Prop D to the impact on the community to the failure to comply with city land use law, we allege that this isn't a use that should be allowed to continue and we're going to seek a court order to put a halt to it. The three-day launch of the market, which only allowed medical marijuana patients with doctor's authorizations, took place over the July 4th weekend. Thousands of patients came to the warehouse, drawn by the promise of lower prices and farmer-to-consumer cannabis sales. About 25 vendors offered marijuana products and supplies, and the line of attendees stretched for blocks. David Welch, an attorney representing West Coast Collective, the East LA dispensary behind the initial event, said he was shocked and disappointed by the city attorney's action. According to Welch, the market allowed growers to sell directly to the collective's patients, which he said reduced prices. It's clear that the voters wanted only 134 dispensaries to operate in the city, Welch said. There's hundreds in the city today. Yet the city attorney is going to waste resources on one of the 134 that his own website list is being allowed to operate? Until the judge decides that this is an improper way of operating, my clients have no intent of ceasing, Welch said. Before we go, I'd like to direct your attention to a must-read on Tokesignals.com. It's from a new author for us. Her name is Jenna Markowski, and she's an expert in marketing. The article is The Straight Dope, Marketing Marijuana and Promotional Products. And with the launch of recreational marijuana markets in both Colorado and Washington, the potential for marijuana marketing and associated promotional products just got exponentially bigger. You'll want to take a look at that very inform informative and interesting article along with a great infographic there on TopeSignals.com. Until next week. I hope your plan is as mine to stay lifted. I'll see you then. <laughs>